All right, cool. Uh, welcome everyone. I am Emily O'Meara. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk about applying the principles of product-led growth to open source projects. Uh, before I start, I'll introduce myself just super briefly. I'm a positioning consultant and I work with primarily open source startups uh, doing things like figuring out what their differentiated value proposition is, how to explain what it is that their project does in an accurate and differentiated way. And then I also host a podcast called The Business of Open Source, and I talk to a lot of people about the intersection of business and open source. All right, so uh, let's dive in. Uh, so product-led growth is just a growth model, uh, usually obviously in a commercial setting, uh, that refers to um, a bottoms-up approach, so where your product is supposed to uh, drive all kinds of growth all by itself. Uh, the, the contrast is with uh, what would be called a, a sales-led uh, growth, where you have a sales team that's going to be like cold calling accounts and driving growth of your product that way. So product-led growth Sorry, I'm not sure if my microphone is working correctly or not. I'll assume it is. <laughs> um, uh, so pro in product-led growth, you want your, your product without any interaction from any human being to help people discover it. So driving customer acquisition, um, encouraging people to continue using it, and then also uh, expanding, which means people should be ideally referring your product to their friends, but then also like using it more and more and more. So in a commercial sense, this would mean like, you know, each individual is spending more money with your, your product. Um, and when you think of some good examples of like what's product led versus what's sales led, think about Slack versus Microsoft Teams is a really good example. So Slack had a, a product led uh, growth model where they encouraged actual users to use the product. They built it for the, the needs of the users in mind, um, whereas Microsoft Teams, generally speaking, had a more top-down approach where you'd have like a executive or an IT person who's like, everyone here is using Microsoft Teams. Um, you don't like it, um, that's too bad. Uh, so uh, the, the, those are the differences. Think of the, the, those two approaches or those two companies um, as really good examples of, of each approach. So uh, when we're talking about this, particularly in an open source context, uh, I think if you look like really at a surface level at product-led growth, it can look like a field of dreams uh, because it's, it's like that sort of ideal, yes, we're gonna build an awesome project and everyone's gonna come use it and it's gonna require zero effort uh, other than building our project, um, but that's actually not true. And the, the companies that do this for their commercial products put in a ton of effort into optimizing the, how their product is moving people from discovery to usage to referral and they also put a lot of effort into figuring out their, their fundamentals. So it, it is um, sort of seems deceptively easy when actually product-led growth is, is quite challenging. And, and that isn't any different in an open source context, right? It's, it's still that you're, you're gonna have to put some thought and effort, like non-coding, non-building thought and effort into your project if you want to really succeed with, with project-led growth. Um, so, the thing is though, like most open source projects don't have a sales team that are making cold calls and trying to get like people to, you know, executives to force their project on their entire team. So by default, open source projects are following some kind of project-led growth strategy. It's just that by and large, they're not doing so with intention. And that means like some people might do it fairly well, almost accidentally. Um, some, some people might do it less so, uh, but there's a lot less, um, there's, there's not as much intention and iteration and figuring out, well, if we, if we change this about our project, how does that impact um, how many people are, are discovering it naturally, for example, or you know, how, how their experience is. So that's basically why I wanted to do this talk, was to encourage more open source maintainers to be really intentional about their growth strategy and take some of the ideas 
from a product-led growth strategy and incorporate it into how they think about their evangelism and then also how they think about their project roadmap because product-led growth involves both. It's not just, it's not just a marketing initiative. Okay, so what are the sort of three pillars of product-led growth? First of all, user-focused design. Generally speaking, open source projects have this down. Uh, they're not usually designed with the needs of like the executive team um, in mind. They're, they're built for the person who's gonna be actually interacting with the project. Awesome. Um, the second one, delivering value before capturing value. This is one where I think there can be some misunderstanding because some, when people talk in a commercial context about uh, capturing value, what they mean is like capturing your money and open source projects are not doing that. However, uh, open source projects do ask people to invest time. And I think often they underestimate how valuable that time is. And there's a lot of ways that an open source project can, can ask for that time investment. One is just asking people to you know, spend four hours setting the project up and doing configurations and figuring out how to use it before they get any value out of the project. So that's, that's one, just investing time in order to just use it on their own. Um, but open source projects also want people to be active members of the community. They want people possibly to even contribute code, um, ideally to, to be evangelists for the project. Uh, that is a, a type of value that you, you know, as a maintainer, could possibly be capturing from your, your audience. So you want to make sure that your project is delivering a lot of value as soon as possible without asking very much from people who are using that, that project. And then uh, the, the third thing is sort of a question of intentionality, building your product with growth in mind, building your project, uh, thinking about uh, how is this project built so that it removes friction for uh, users? How is it encouraging people to use this project over and over again? Uh, how does it encourage people to you know, interact with it increasingly? To sh is, are there any network effects? Uh, how is it encouraging people to talk to their colleagues and friends and get them using this, this same project? And uh, that is mostly a question of intentionality. Is it something that you're even considering as you're thinking about what's this project roadmap looking like? Okay, so let's talk about some practical ways uh, that you can apply these principles, these pillars of product-led growth to open source projects. But before we do, um, also talk about some um, ideas, some product-led growth ideas that, that you have to keep in mind. Um, one is the natural growth rate. Uh, even if you have you know, a, a hobby open source project that uh, does not have like a marketing budget or anything, you're probably doing some kind of evangelism activity. Uh, you might be writing blog posts, you might be speaking at conferences, I don't know, something like that. You're telling people about the, the project. Uh, your natural growth rate is actually how much your, product, your project would grow uh, if you did none of that. You, you just put your project out there and you just uh, allowed people to discover it uh, without any sort of activities on, on your part. And it's just kind of a benchmark to think about, um, is this growing even with, with me doing absolutely nothing to, to promote it? The next one is the activation rate, which is actually really important in um, thinking about project-led growth. Um, activation is the moment when somebody first uses your project and they experience like a magic moment. Uh, they ba basically they experience a value. So the example of Slack being a good example, um, when you send a message on Slack that's, you're considered activated um, because you've sort of experienced the value of Slack. You're not activated if you've just like created an account or if you've downloaded the application. Um, we could use another example like um, an app like Uber. If you download Uber, you're not activated. If you actually like book a ride, take the ride, you're, you're activated. And that activation metric um, has, it, it correlates really heavily to somebody who's then gonna stick around. You want somebody to activate as soon as possible after like downloading your, your app or your project. And it's also really important to know what activation is. Because while for those examples that I just did, 
uh, it, it seems sort of obvious. And not all projects and not all products have a very obvious, or they, they often do many things. And so it's not always obvious what exactly your, your activation moment is going to be. Uh, but you want to track that. And you want to know how many people um, compared to how many people are activating versus how many are just downloading and then going away. Obviously, you want to, you want to know your retention, um, how many people are using your, your project one time and then never interacting with it again. You want to track how engaged people are. Uh, this can mean how many people are becoming active in your community, uh, but also uh, are they using your, your project over and over again? Are they using it every day? Are they using it every month? Um, those sorts of metrics are really important. And then, of course, um, are they telling people about it? That's really important to know. Uh, all of these things, quite honestly, can be hard to track, and they are harder in a, for an open source project uh, than for a commercial product. But they are things that you want to, like metrics that you, you want to have in mind if you're thinking about really applying um, project, product led growth to open source projects. Um, but the bottom line is that you want to think about how do I create a project that is really easy to discover, uh, it's really easy to use, and it's really easy to get value from uh, without any kind of interaction with any human being. And, or possibly you know, with your community, but ideally without a human being. You'd want no human interaction in order for somebody to um, have discovered this project, used it, gotten value out of it, and thought that it was totally awesome. All right, so uh, let's talk about some steps to help make this happen. Uh, the first step is actually defining what your goal is. And the reason that this is important for open source projects is because unlike in a commercial scenario where your uh, success metric is really obvious, it's more profit, uh, in an open source context, your success metric is non-obvious. So it could just be that you want Sorry. Uh, it could just be that you want more users. It could be that you want more code contributors. It could be that you want to connect this to whatever your larger goal for your open source project is, which maybe is like hiring people who are, are active in your open source community or whatever it is. Maybe it's that you personally have a side project that you want to help you get another job. Uh, and having in mind what is going to be success from the, the growth of your project uh, allows you to track the metrics that are actually going to get you there. Um, if you only care about increasing users, then you're going to focus on your, your users' metrics. And as you're evaluating, is this growth strategy working, you want to look at the user numbers versus the code contributor numbers. OK, so the next step is really important, which is nailing your marketing fundamentals. So part of uh, any project-led growth is making it easy for people to discover the, the project and really easy for them to um, understand, is this going to fit my needs or is this not going to fit my needs? And to do this without interacting with a human being. So it means that you need to position your project well. So you need to explain really well what's unique about your, your project, be accurate, be differentiated, um, be clear so that people understand um, and they don't have to spend two hours downloading, playing around with your project only to discover that this doesn't actually fit their needs very well. Or almost even worse, uh, using your project for something that it can kind of work for, uh, but doesn't really work very well for, because then you get like disgruntled users. Um, so you want to be very clear uh, and very intentional about how you're positioning and also communicating about your, your project. That's like testing and refining your messaging. So that means figuring out how to talk about your project and actually you know, testing if it's working and changing the message. And when I say the, the, the message, the message that you're putting out on your website, um, in your readme, places like that, um, getting input, getting feedback from people, and then, and then making adjustments to see how, 
to, to make it uh, resonate more with the people in your audience. You also have to understand who the people in your audience are, um, what characteristics they share, uh, what characteristics they, they do not share, what's unimportant, uh, so that you can create documentation, you can create a website, that, and you can create a project, quite frankly, that's going to work really well um, just for those people who, who are in, you know, a, a, have, share very specific characteristics. You also need to know like what outcome people are expecting. Uh, this can also be a little bit of a gotcha because you might have created your project with a particular outcome in mind, and sometimes you will find that that matches the the users that actually come to your to your project, and sometimes you'll find that it doesn't match exactly what people are expecting. And you need to communicate, you know, exactly what you expect, what people should expect to get out of your project, again, so that they um, are able to discover it and then sort of use it and be happy with, with what they've got. So I said, you know, you need to understand who your users are, but you also need to know why they're using your project. And uh, how they're interacting with your project. So. We can talk a lot about reducing friction, getting people like quicker time to value, uh, but you have to know like where is the friction in what is preventing somebody from getting value out of your project sooner. This is where it can be really valuable to do user interviews uh, where you have somebody sc share their screen and actually interact with your, your project at this, uh, in, in real time. Because then you can see where are the sticking points, uh, what could I change so that people are able to more easily interact with, with my project. Um, you also want to understand like why did people start using the project in the first place so that you can connect uh, with others and um, adjust your message to connect with more people um, who are experiencing whatever problem it was that, that, you're, that are bringing your users to you. Um, and then just figure out, you know, how, how are people discovering your project and how can you help more people like, like them uh, find your project? Okay, so next is very important, optimize for time to value. So figure out what is what are the obstacles that are standing in the way of, of getting value out of your your project and eliminate them uh, this is involves making design choices right are we going to ask somebody to do a ton of of work at the very beginning of using our project or are we going to um, build it in a way so that you get something really immediate get a, like provide a sort of immediate wow and then maybe I'll ask for work after that. But building your, pro your project in a way that provides like a, a very obvious aha eureka moment is one of the best ways to, to follow a, a product-led or project-led growth strategy. But there's a couple other things that you really need to do. So one is investing in really good documentation. Uh, Maybe the reason, maybe the friction that's preventing someone from getting value really quickly out of your project is that they are unclear about how they're gonna set something up. It's really important in your documentation though, not just to focus on the how, you also have to focus on the why. So why would somebody want to use your project or use a particular feature in your project? Uh, and then also how do they, do they make it start working? You also want to make sure your support is really good. Um, because uh, you, for, for actually two reasons. One, obviously, if someone needs help, uh, you want to help them. But your end goal is to make it so they don't have to interact with a human being at all. You're not going to understand what those, what those sticking points are unless you have invested heavily in making sure that there, there's a way for you, you to get the question and then later incorporate that that question either into changes in your documentation or changes in how your project is, is actually built or and used. Um, one of the sort of core tenets of product-led growth in general is a good user experience. Uh, this is not something that all open source projects are known for. 
and uh, just as, quite frankly, like a very short time to value is also not something that a lot of open source projects are known for. Uh, so if you want to really focus on, on a project-led growth strategy, that's something you want to think about prioritizing, like really good user experience, really short uh, time to value. Okay, so this is also a, a design choice. Not all software delivers an aha moment. But the, the ones that are sort of the, the best fit for a product-led growth or project-led growth strategy do. Um, so a counterexample to this would be like, uh, if you had a, a software that is only going to you know, give you uh, reports over time and you have to install it now, and then like two months later, you are gonna get a report about how certain metrics go up or down. First of all, that's a really long time to value. It's a really long time to, to any sort of aha moment. Uh, so that's not a good fit for, uh, any, for a product-led growth strategy. Um, but, uh, so if you, if you do want to have uh, this, this product-led, project-led uh, strategy, you wanna make sure that there is a moment when people interact with your project that is magical. Uh, one example I've seen of this is a, a open source project that allows people to visualize the relationships between their cloud infrastructure. And you would install this software and then boom, you'd be able to, to see how everything interrelates to each other and users would consistently say, this was a magical moment because I'd never had this view of all of my cloud resources. Now I do. That's their, that's their activation metric. In um, product-led growth, the sort of key marker is having an activation, met uh, activ activation rate that's over 40%. That seems a little bit low, but uh, actually the, the, the reality is that a lot of people download stuff and sign up for stuff and never use it. So if you have 40% or more of people who download your, your project actually opening it up and actually doing whatever thing it is that, that, that you do, actually getting the value that you provide, uh, you're good. That, that's a really good sign that, that your, your uh, project is gonna grow. And then yeah, you have to, the magic moment should happen like as immediately as possible. And, and that's a product design decision uh, that you can either make or not, but make it as easy as possible for people to get to that magic moment. Okay, so last but not least, and this is why, uh, this is why product-led growth takes a lot more effort than people expect. You have to uh, iterate a lot. So while, for example, while it seems like obvious what some activation metrics should be, uh, a lot of companies that do, that do product-led growth find it actually fairly challenging to figure out what the precise moment is, what the best moment is that they should be measuring. Um, and you wanna see you know, how do changes that we're making in our product in our messaging, uh, in our website, uh, how are they impacting all of these metrics? The, uh, the activation rate, uh, the natural growth rate, the referral rate, et cetera. Which is gonna lead me actually to talk about why this is really, really hard for open source projects. And the first thing is uh, around metrics. So, uh, most open source maintainers don't have access to very many metrics about what's going on in their community. And uh, if you do, if you wanna be really serious about uh, applying a, a project-led growth approach, you probably have to uh, get some more metrics than, than you currently are, some more metrics than the standards. Um, the best way to do that without making people angry is to be very transparent about it. Um, so be very transparent about any metrics that you're collecting. Um, but if you're leaving yourself totally in the dark about even you know, what's happening after the download moment, then it's gonna be really challenging to actually take an intentional iterative approach to your growth strategy. Um, so 
Another thing is the, the, the feedback loop. I mean, this is, goes to the metrics problem, uh, but feed the, another kind of feedback is also interviews. Uh, you, a, a lot of products, or a lot of open source projects don't have a super tight feedback loop uh, that encompasses more than people who are actively coming to the community. Uh, and, and more than what they're actively bringing to that community. So again, you want to try to get more information about what's going on in the minds of, of your users, and uh, that can be challenging. And, and many open source projects find that that sort of effort is deprioritized, but it is really important if you want to um, you know, really take seriously your, your growth strategy. So poor documentation can also be a, a really big challenge. Uh, this goes not just for open source projects, but a, a lot of software in general struggles with, with not so great documentation. But documentation is really important because it scales more than interaction with human beings. Uh, you can uh, reach so many more people if you have really, really good documentation. Uh, so this is something to focus on uh, for open source projects that want to grow uh, naturally. And then just not being intentional. So um, what you want to do, do when whatever growth strategy you're following, you just want to be intentional about it, be aware. And that's not always what happens with open source projects. Um, often open source projects are not even sure what those like, success criteria are. And that's sort of the, the most basic thing to, to know where you're trying to go. So I would say uh, if you are intentional, you're collecting metrics, uh, you've invested in uh, having pretty good uh, documentation, and you try to get to actively elicit feedback, uh, you're going to be way ahead of the game in, in terms of implementing product-led growth. Um, and I'm going to end with a couple more challenges, which is finding the right aha moment. And this last one I wanted to make sure to touch on because when you talk to people who are like product-led growth professionals, this is what they do is they, they work with companies on product-led growth, they will all say that they feel like there's a certain amount of luck and guesswork that goes into getting product-led growth right. And that while you can look in hindsight at companies that have like been these huge product-led growth successes, um, it can sometimes be really challenging to see, like sometimes you only see that that success with hindsight, and it can be really challenging to see in the moment, is this the right decision or not? You know, is our, is our product-led growth strategy um, working or not? So uh, all these things can help your project grow, but you have to sort of accept that it's both an art and a science, and you, you may not feel 100% in, in control of your project's growth, uh, even if you do like follow all of the product-led growth, growth uh, best practices. So on that very optimistic note, that's it. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yep. The, okay, I'm supposed to repeat your question. Uh, the clarifying question is, is the aha moment and the activation the same? Yes. So the aha moment is the thing that your, uh, when you talk about your, your activation rate, it is the percentage of people who experience your aha moment. Okay. Yep. Any other questions? What do you, I'm not sure if I understand. Okay, now I understand. Okay, let me repeat the question. Um, the question is, let, let me actually also make sure I understand the question. So if you are building an open source project because you're scratching your own itch, does that like always mean that 
the, like the aha moment that you experienced will be the same as the aha moment that your users will experience? Is that the question? Okay, I'm actually really glad that you asked this question because the answer is maybe. So, and, and this is actually one of the biggest challenges is that just because you built something to scratch your own itch doesn't necessarily mean that your project is going to, like it, it might mean that your project is gonna go out into the world and scratch that exact same itch for, for, for everyone else, but it might turn out that there's some other thing that people start using your project for that is, I'm not gonna say unrelated, but usually tangential to that itch that you were originally scratching. And that's something you wanna be really aware of. So um, sometimes you'll find that the, that the aha, the magic moment is the one that you like set out to, to create, um, but you don't want to assume that that is actually how users are experiencing it. Any other questions? Yeah. The best way to capture that moment? Like, like to identify it, for instance, because you can, someone can enter into your, your uh, community and then you, you can, like, you, like what, how do you track what's happening after that? Like, when their aha, uh -huh, does it happen within their onboarding? Does it happen when, within a few weeks mm -hmm. uh, when they start participating in your community? So the question is, like, how do you track? Um, what is what the aha moment is and and what's happening like as as people are going through the onboarding process is that right Yeah, so the, so she was saying, like, would, how, how do you know when they're experiencing the aha moment? That definitely, I would say, like, you ask them. And you don't have to ask everybody, but you should ask some people. And I think that it's a, you'll, you'll get much better answers if you have a conversation versus if you send a questionnaire. Because um, if you ask somebody, like, did you experience a magic moment? They'll be like, no. And... Um, the, but if you ask them, like, can you tell me what happened when you when you started using this project? Can you can you walk me through uh, why you started, why you downloaded it in the first place? Um, what did you find after you had got it set up? What were you able to do? And and see how they they react to that. Um, that's how you're going to get the information. You do have to do a certain number, like have a certain number of these conversations, because there's going to be weirdos. So you don't want to pay too much attention to the weirdos. But on the other hand, if you have like 10 conversations and like nine of them are weirdos, then the weirdos are right. So that, that's, that's the thing that you want to like pay really close attention to. Um, and like, but have those conversations and see what the commonalities are. Yep. I kind of like. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. Uh, can you specify some of the metrics that you found pretty useful? So my, my assumption is once you design those success criteria, that's where you're going to build your OKR towards. But before we even reach that OKR, I assume there are some more fine-grained uh, metrics that you probably find that more useful that building towards there. So I want to know some, whether it's tooling or whether it's anything specific you recommend. So there's a company called Scarf. There's a company called Scarf that also has uh, an open source project. They'll help co collect a lot more metrics uh, about what's happening in open source projects uh, than you would just get like by default. Uh, the the thing that you will really want to pay attention to is not just are people downloading, but also are they using. Like, are they actually using the, the project? So um, that's, you know, absent any sort of qualitative feedback, that's the thing that I would be looking at is, um, you know, looking at number of people downloading, then number of people actually actively interacting with the project, and then from there, um, how many people are joining your community. Uh, I'd say those are the, the three things that you want to track.
what was that? Yeah, so da downloading versus people who are actually actively using the project and, and then who are joining your community, whatever it is. I mean, you could actually add a fourth in there because people will join your community and never participate. Um, so people actually participating in, in your community. Um, this is great. How can so how might how might you find good examples of product like growth in in open source projects? So to be totally honest, I would say any open source project that has become very successful, like it, that means that they have used a product led growth. I, I can't think of any examples of an open source project that like was like I said like was like calling people, you know, cold calling executives and like, hey, force all your developers to use this open source project. Um, so that, that's why I would say like the, ultimately product led growth is the default growth strategy that open source projects use, um, but they're not always aware and, or, or thinking about how to take these ideas and, and put it into open source. Um, I'm just wondering whether uh, some kind of investigation uh, could be done to investigate um, how many you know companies or this kind of open source communities are successful following this uh, practice. Hmm. The, so thinking about how many companies are successful um, following product led growth. That's interesting. I don't really have a good answer to that question. Um, I think. Uh, so I actually think that the number of open source projects that are very intentional about any growth strategy is, uh, as a percentage of all open source projects, relatively small. Um, so, and then intentionality is kind of like the, the bottom line. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know like exactly the, I don't know what the research would find. If we have one more question, we could do that or we could finish up. Okay, let's do it. Uh, I see you have the podcast listed. Do you have um, one recorded that's very similar to this discussion? I'd love to share it with uh, my coworkers. Uh, well, um, I did um, have a podcast by, with a woman named Sam um, from OpenView and she is a product-led growth specialist. So that, that, I think it was recorded, I think it published last December, I wanna say. Um, so yeah, that's who it, Sam Richards is her name. Okay, that's it. Thank you so much for coming and uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of the conference.